right, guys. Welcome to another episode of Moist Style Podcast. Today we have Steve Springer um, with Quality at Bats. He's, uh, he's pretty well known in the baseball world. He's a former professional player, and he's worked with a lot of uh, major league players, especially on the mental side of it. And me and myself have been following Steve for a long, long time, and I honestly wish I had him. I, I, I could have listened to him back when I was playing. Uh, it definitely would have helped me out quite a bit. But now that I'm coaching, I'm definitely trying to pass it on to the next generation and help out the kids that I coach. So um, Steve does a lot of uh, speaking engagements across the nation. Um, and um, he does, I feel like he does a great job and he gets you, definitely gets your mind right. So Steve, I really appreciate you for being on today. Um, how about we get started with you kind of sharing a little bit of your story and then we'll just kind of roll in with the questions. Hello, Moy. Thanks for uh, having me on, boy. I know, I know it took a little time, buddy, but uh, I'm yeah, glad no we're here. I just got back from the ABCA with 6,000 coaches there and it was, it was awesome because I've spoken at that three times and, you know, I couldn't go 10 yards without a coach wanting to say hi and, mm-hmm. and, and thanks for, thank me for what I do. It was so humbling. It was so cool to, you know, have an impact on coaches and dads and players. You know, I've been doing this thing for about 20 years now. And, uh, you know, I, I love telling my story. Everybody's got a story. And, you know, I, I when I was a, a freshman in high school, I was 4'11", 90 pounds. I was the smallest kid in school. I made the team because my brother was the star of the team. Uh, he was a stud. He was one year older than me. Uh, I got three at bats my freshman year in high school. Never played. Coach first base. Uh, my sophomore year, all my buddies went up to JV and varsity. I stayed on soft rush. I got to play. I would rather play at a lower level than sit the bench at a higher level. I, I don't want you kids to remember that, man. You need to play. Right? And my, my junior, all my buddies were on varsity, and I was on JV, but I got to play. If I was on varsity, I would have sat the bench. And I know that because I sat the bench as a senior. I had a sophomore take my job. I didn't start as a senior. I was 5'8", 140 pounds. So I grew nine inches in high school. I went from tiny to small. I was a small senior. Um, where I'm from, I got 50 colleges within 50 miles of me. Within 50 miles of me, I did, not, uh, I did not get one phone call to come play for him. My brother went to Golden West Junior College. He was all state, best player on the team. I'm thinking the coach knows I'm coming there. Uh, he didn't have to call me because <laughs> he didn't. <laughs> uh, and I went out for the team during the summer and I got cut, which is baffling to me to this day on how bad this guy thought I sucked. Like my brother's the best player on the team and I got cut. So I got a job at Disneyland working on the canoes. And about three days later, my brother came up home with a uniform because three guys quit. So I was 19 years old, freshman in college. I got three at bats the whole year, never played, coached first base again. Uh, and I played in the big leagues. You know, so all you kids out there, you think you're too small, man. Nobody's too small. When you get your man body, you're going to be able to shrink two inches. It's not about being tall. It's about being a baseball player. It's about having body strength. It's about having instincts. I was always a really good player when I was 9, 10, 11, 12. I was an all-star when I was 11, 12. I was in the majors when I was 9. I didn't grow an inch from the time I was 12 to 15 and playing on the big field. And this is the problem with youth baseball right now is as parents, we, we put our kid in a microwave instead of an oven. We think it's all about right now. We think it's about the Burger King championship when I'm 10. And I'm telling you right now, this is about, you know, if you want your kid to play in college and hopefully pro baseball one year, we got to put him in an oven, man. We got to hit every stop. We got to, we got to uh, uh, teach development over winning. And, You know, when you start thinking like this, you know, I just believe it's a better game. It's better for your kid. And too many kids quit this game at 13 years old because of the pressure that's put on them by the one who loves the most, us parents. And Johnny Wack, job testosterone coach, yelling at my 10-year-old to win the Burger King Championship. And now the kid's playing with tension, anxiety, and pressure instead of calmness, toughness, focus, and and having fun. You know, and and like I said, you don't need to be six foot three, bro. You need to be a baseball player. Now, in saying that, I grew four inches when I was 20. Now I'm six foot, 170 pounds. I'm getting recruited by all these colleges at a full ride to Long Beach State, full ride to Irvine, full ride to, to UCLA. Uh, my dad's favorite school. My best friend, Rich Amaral, is going there. I'm going there as a uh, shortstop, full ride. And it was the greatest five days of my life until I looked at my transcripts. He's like, <laughs> really, buddy? Uh, you, you, you took badminton, and, you know, and, uh, tennis? Uh, don't get me wrong, bro. I could play some badminton, but uh, I couldn't get in. So kids out there, listen to your parents and get good grades, right? Let your ability dictate where you're going to go to school, not your grades. I had a full ride to UCLA. I couldn't get in. I don't know how I got into Utah. 
Uh, I went to the University of Utah, and this is the best thing about baseball because whether you're in travel ball, high school, college, pro ball, you're evaluated every single day but, uh, that you play by somebody, and you don't know who's at the game. And we had 50 scouts in the stand to see Rick Aguilera, Wally Joyner, Corey Schneider, and about three other guys on Brigham Young that were stars. And I went five for five with a bomb, two doubles, and, and uh, five RBIs. And the scout never heard of me. And he's like, who the heck is number seven from Utah? And one day got me drafted. It was the very first day I played the outfield. I sucked in the outfield. Uh, and But I thank God about wasn't hit to me. And, and he saw me go five for five, and I get drafted by the New York Mets in the 20th round. Uh, I went to Little Falls, New York. I never played every day. I was so tired. You know, you guys say you want to play pro baseball one day. You better be strong because you're getting five at-bats a day every day whether you want them or not. And I was so tired. I hit 246, 11 home runs. Uh, my brother got picked up by the Tigers. So we went home that off season and we lifted and we got in that weight room, bro. We got a new body. Every, every, hey, all these high school kids that just, all you do is hit in the cage, hit in the cage, hit in the cage, bro. Every, other, every other time you want to go hit in the cage, go lift weights, go get a new body. I'm not talking about 12 year olds. I'm talking about high school kid when it's time to lift and get stronger, right? Go work on your defense every other time. Uh, this is not about just hitting in a cage, bro. Um, so I went to my first spring training and I barely made the low A ball team as the fifth outfielder. And so for the first month of the season, I'm coaching first base again. I'm like, you know, how do you handle not playing? Because not playing sucks, right? right? Here's how you handle not playing guys. When you're in high school and college or lucky enough to play pro baseball, you take batting practice like it's your game. You take ground balls during batting practice like it's your game. You take fly balls during batting practice like it's your game. And you pull for your buddies to win the game and you be ready when the coach calls your name. I remember like it was yesterday, our second baseman got traded. And I told my coach, I said, coach, I'm an infielder. Can I play second base? And he said, well, thank God you suck in the outfield. Uh -huh. And I said, all right, no, I'm an infielder. And so he let me play second base. Everything's going great. Eighth inning ground ball, double play right to my legs. So I didn't play there for about a week. A week went by, let's me play there again. Everything's going real good. Eighth inning ground ball, double play right between my legs again. But I got four hits that day. And you want to play at any level, bro, you better hit. I ended up playing every single day the rest of the year. I ended up leading the league in hits. I had 165 hits. I was second league and hit behind Vince Coleman, who could fly. I still didn't know what I was doing, but I could hit a fastball. Now I go to instruction league. They're treating me a little bit different. Uh, I go home, me and my brother lifting. I go to my second spring train. I'm working out with high A ball. I see my uh, farm director. He's like, spring, how's everything going? I'm like, I don't mean to be an idiot, but I just let a league enable on hits. I feel I should be in double A. And this guy looked at me, paused, walked away, didn't say a word. And I'm like, wow, that went great. Uh, but it did go great. It made sense to him. And uh, the next day I was in double A. And my double A team, we had 18 guys playing the big leagues. Right? A lot of, a lot, it's one of, the, one of my lines when I speak, who saw Moneyball? And everybody raised their hand. I go, well, I was in his wedding. All right, Billy Bean and <laughs> Brad Pitt, man. I was in Billy Bean's wedding. And he was everything he said he was. He was six foot four, 220 pounds. He had power, he had speed, he could throw, he could do it all. But he had football mentality. He was a perfectionist. And, you know, he's a great GM. He's a great, he was a great player, right? Right. But you cannot be a perfectionist in this game by the elite. Yeah, there's one perfect Jesus. That's it. And right. when you uh, think you got to be perfect, you're never going to be. So you're always in a negative mindset. Uh, so right. we win it all. And the next year, I go to AAA. Right. Three years ago, I'm coaching first base. I'm one step away from the big leagues and I spent 11 years in AAA. <laughs> I feel yeah. blessed to say I got two hits in each game in the big leagues. Uh, but you can't tell me I shouldn't have spent five years in the big leagues. Billy Beans quote on my website. He's like, Spring, if you knew this at 18, instead of learning at 30, people might know who you are. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, buddy. Because at the time I'm like, really good? 11 years, huh? And right. now I know why, because whether I'm talking to you, whether I'm talking to the dad of a 10-year-old major league all-star top college in the country, my message is the same, man. Right. Uh, anybody that knows anything about me, the most evil thing in baseball, the thing that destroys more young kids than anything in the game at all levels, it's the batting average, man. It's the biggest trap in the game, man. I hit three balls right on the screws right at somebody. I beat the pitcher. The pitcher knows I beat him. Pitcher's mom knows I beat him. My batting average comes down like this. I think I failed, and now the wrong me starts playing. Because every single one of you guys watching this have two players in you. I got a confident guy who's a really good player, and I got a non-confident guy who sucks, and he plays too much. My whole thing, what I teach is how do I get the right guy playing every single day? If I got a confident player and a non-confident player, 
what's the question? How do I create confidence is the question. So how do we get the confident player playing? And if I get you guys to do four things the rest of your life, walk up to play with confidence, with an attainable goal to hit the ball hard, hard attack the inside part of the speed you're looking for. And if we had a game tonight, I'm looking for 25 confident players to show up to help your team win the game. And when you guys figure it's not about me, it's about me helping my team, when you figure it out, two completely different players. Right. right. And I was the mental coach of the Blue Jays for eight years. I talked them into spending a lot of money on Best Buy gift cards. We had two, we had three winners per week per team where the most quality at bats won a gift card. And we had one guy go one for 20 and he won a card. How's mm -hmm. that happen? He got one right. hit, he got a couple bunts down, he got a couple runners from, from uh, second to third with nobody out, and he had seven balls right on the screws right at somebody who's 12 for 20. And that guy's name was Kevin Pilar. So the next time you think you're getting hosed, this guy had a 54-game hitting streak as a junior in college and did not get drafted, which is wow. baffling to me. There should have been 50 scouts fired because you don't luck into 54, bro. You could hit. You luck into three, right? We took him We took him in the 32nd round as a senior, gave him $1,000, and he was the second guy in his draft to get to the big leagues. You know why? Because he was a better competitor than he was a player. And that's the whole thing, bro. There's no such thing as an overachiever in the big leagues. He is not an overachiever. He's a really, right. really good player. But do you know how many underachievers there are in this game? You know how many first-round picks can't get out of a ball? Mm -hmm. And it's not because of their ability. It's because of their mind. And we had an annual award with the Blue Jays. Whoever the most quality at bats got a big check and a nice max, pack, max uh, bat trophy. And our double-A guy had more quality at bats than anybody, David Cooper, and he hit 245. But he had wow. 20 bombs and he had 80 RBIs. He did damage, right? And his favorite quote in what I teach is good hitters line out more. Get great at lining out. Get great at hitting balls hard. When I go do my speaking engagement, I tell these kids, when somebody asks you what you do for a living, you tell them you hit balls hard for a living. And you change what you think success is to get the right guy playing, right? Mm -hmm. I'm good when I'm confident. How do I create confidence? And by the way, I'm trying to help you hit your highest batting average. The batting average right. has no brain, right? It's not a confident batting average stat and a non-confident batting average stat. It's one stat, and it's not going away. Right, but we got to get the right guy playing. We got we got to learn how to hunt speeds. Right? <clears throat> Too many hitters they they're looking for everything. They're not ready for anything. It's one of my. It's it's basically the second thing I talk about when I speak. Is it easier to hit one pitch when you know it's coming, or three and you don't? Right. If if I told you here comes a fastball, one hundred percent, you can't put a good swing on it and go play soccer, bro. Hmm. Right? We got to be able to do that, right? But sometimes I I believe it's okay to sit off speed. Right. Like, uh, how, how come we could uh, hit the breaking ball machine in the cage and it turns invisible during the game? Because we know it's coming in the cage. Well, that's the one data that I would want with analytics is what's this guy throwing certain counts? Mm -hmm. and, and please don't take it the wrong way because I always want to hit the fastball and until it's time not to. I, I, I told uh, I told this to Mark Trumbo, who called me his whole career. <clears throat> and I said, buddy, when you're sitting on that fastball, I want you to look for it up in the zone. Because it's going to be easier for look up here and adjust to the knee high rather than look for the knee high. And then he elevates you. And he said, mm -hmm. really? You're holding that one back after seven years? And, and he hits 48 bombs hunting the high fastball, taking the controlled violence swing. Because that's right. what hitting is, Moy. It's controlled violence. It's not violent violent. It's not controlled control. It's controlled violent act to hit a baseball. I believe that hitting is slow feet, fast hands, quiet head, taking a control, violent swing. I think the feet screw up more hitters than anything in the game because we all want a little bit of more power. And now we got the big leg kick. And I'm telling you, if you have a big leg kick and you're not hitting, get rid of the leg kick. Right? Right. Or modify it, at least. You know, I got guys that, you know, have called me their whole career that have minimal stride, no stride. And then I got some with a stride. You know, Paul mm. Goldsmith barely moves his feet. But he's strong, and he gets stuck back <clears throat> inside. In my DVD, I talk about hitting between four and six. The pitcher's one, the catcher's ten. My neutral stance is five. we got to get something back inside six and hit up against four. And that doesn't mean you need to lift your feet. I believe the slower your feet are, the, more, the, the quieter your eyes are. And you see mm -hmm. the ball better. And Goldsmith sees the ball so well. And he's called me his whole career. It's A.J. Pollock, who's like my son's talked to, talked to him twice a week his whole career. Uh, AJ got my stuff when he was uh, a sophomore in, uh, in at Notre Dame, and he went out to the Cape, and somebody burned him one of my CDs, so he still owes me 20 bucks. I'm kidding. <laughs> sort of. And uh, 
<laughs> he, he said, Spring, I listened to it every day when I was in the car. If I did the four things you talk about, walk up, play with confidence, with attainable goal, hit the ball hard, I attacked the inside part of the speed I was looking for. I was there to help my team when he was MVP of the case. Well, AJ's called me his whole career, and, and Goldsmith's his new best friend, and he hits eight home runs uh, this first September. He earned the job the next year. Well, if you look it up, his first year, first full season, he was hitting 180 with two home runs, about ready to get sent down, and Pollock's like, dude, call this guy. A good guy. I never even heard of Gold. I, I've heard of him. I never seen him uh, play. Don't even know mm-hmm. what he looked like. And he calls me up. I said, "Buddy, your career starts today." When you say, "I don't care what I hit," I can't have a goal where I can do everything right. Go for four, bro. It's a trap. Uh, he was like one for twenty at the time. I said, "If you go three for four tonight, the media still says you suck because now you're four for twenty-four." I mm-hmm. said, "There's two things going to happen if you're not the best competitor on the field tonight." He said, "What?" I said, "One, you got zero chance." being the best player in the field, I said, two, you're cheating your teammates because they need the right goldsmith playing tonight. And I went on for like 20 seconds more, and he, he stops. And he said, well, Spring, hold on. You knocked me on my butt 20 seconds ago. I said, what? He said, when you said I'm cheating my teammates. He said, I don't like that feeling. I said, they don't right. do it. Be the best competitor on the field tonight. It's a choice. Right. Well, thank, well, thank God he got two hits. Right now he's like, hey, Spring, what do you got? Babe? He started a 17-game hitting streak with eight home runs that night, and I've never asked to be at three hits. Well, uh, he, he's the best competitor ever. He's a great kid. Both him and Park they're, are just gold, as not only as players, but as, as people. And they're just so fun to be around. It's so cool when they call and, and we break it down. And whether I'm talking to them or a dad of a 10-year-old, my message is the same, man. How do, we, how, how do we become a better competitor than we are a player? In a game where I can do everything right and it says I suck. Uh, when I finally got the job, or when I got the job with the Toronto Blue Jays, Antonio LaCava hired me. He said, Spring, if you help one guy, you're worth your money. I said, if I don't help 100, fire me, bro. I ain't, I ain't teaching get your hands here, get your feet here. I'm teaching you how to compete with confidence when you're not getting hits because that's going to dictate how far you play. We're all good when we, we get our knocks. How mm-hmm. are you when you're one for 20? And he was like, oh, you're so right. He said, go to triple if you want to. Go to double A once. Get your butt down there with the 16-, 17-, 18-year-old kids and teach them how to compete with confidence when they're not getting hits. Right. But see, this is the whole thing is, is you sign a kid for a million bucks and he thinks he's the next Mike Trout. And all of a sudden he goes one for 20 and he sees it slipping away. And Mike Trout's a freak, bro. It's OK to be a 24, 25, 26, 27 year old big league. But we all think that we, you know, it's going to happen that easy. Right. And I just feel, buddy, when you change what you think success is, <clears throat> get rid of stats. The only stat when I, you know, I was just at the coaches convention, I probably lined up 40 speaking engagements. If I, if I get 20% of them, I'll have the best year of my life. Uh, and I just tell these coaches, man, the only stat that you need to care about is how, how many games in a row can you get 25 confident players showing up and have fun? That's it. It doesn't mean you win every game. It doesn't mean you get three hits. It means the right team's playing. Let the other team play with a 50 man roster. Right. They don't they don't know who's playing. They got two players in them. But most players are going to dictate how they feel and how they did yesterday on, on by what they did yesterday. And the only right. time I want yesterday to play today is when you get two hits. Because I could talk quality at bats so I'm blue in the face, bro. When I get two hits, I don't care if it's a swing and bunt, I feel good. Right? Mm-hmm. My first hit in the big leagues <clears throat> after, you know, 29 years of people telling me I'm not good enough. And I finally got to the big leagues, and I lined out my first at bat. I hit an absolute missile off of Chuck Finley into right center. I'm thinking double, and Dave Winfield takes five giant steps and shoestrings me, and I'm pissed. And my next at bat, he throws me a one-one splitty. My knuckles are still in Cleveland today. I broke my bat. <laughs> a little flare over Johnny Ray's head for a for a hit, and I'm happy. It right. makes no sense. I nut a ball, and I'm mad. I, I get a hit on a broken bat, and I'm happy. So I don't know, man. I figured out a long time ago, man, we better change what we think success is, man, to get the confident guy playing. Right, right. So. <clears throat> now, and and I'm, I want to ask you this just because I, I coach younger ones a lot, and um, and I see this a bunch. So, like, I, I you know, you have – and I, I know you talk about confidence and about, you know, taking bad in practice like you're in the game. But um, if you have a kid that's 12 and under, um, how would you – like – let's say the parent comes up to you and he says, you know, my kid cannot hit in the game to save his life. I mean, he, he's crushing in practice, he's crushing it in lessons, but how can we get him to be confident at the plates in the game? Well, I get the emails too, buddy. And, uh, you know, one, 
you know, somebody's turned your little Messiah into perfection and so you think he's got to be perfect. And two, there might be a little bit of fear factor in that. Right. right. I mean, you know, it's one of my, I talk about it when I speak, when I was nine years old, I got hit by Joe Willett. Uh, nobody knows Joe Willett better than me. He was like 12 to 100, hit me right in the back. And my mom's like, I'm so proud of you didn't cry. I'm like, I couldn't breathe, mom. <laughs> <laughs> Smoke. Me. So first right. of all, we got to make sure there's no fear factor. And parents, 12 you for sure. Get your kid a, a face mask because that's really the only place you could really get hurt. <clears throat> and right. two, we, we need to get these kids to be thinking it's going to be my pitch and not if. Right. Sometimes there's fear and sometimes they're thinking if and then it's too late and then they freeze. We, you know, we need to be thinking it's going to be my pitch and I'm swinging until I don't. Don't get mad at him if he swings at a high pitch aggressively. Uh, but I know one thing, it, it's too many players quit this game at 13 because of the pressure that's put on them by the one who loves them the most, us parents. And, and Johnny Whackjob, you know, my 10-year-old, to win the Burger King Championship. And now all the kid playing with tension, anxiety, and pressure instead of calmness, toughness, focus, having fun. And we get right. so caught up in winning that trophy that we, we forget that, you know what, my, my son's 100 pounds away from his man body. Vanderbilt's not panicking to be as a bad weekend. But we, we think it's all about right now. And right. all of a sudden, that kid quits, and, and the parent will call me, what happened? I'm like, I know what happened. You're a freaking whack job. That's what happened. Mm -hmm. And now the kid it, it doesn't even want to play anymore. It's one of my lines when I speak. You know, if you play with tension, anxiety, and pressure, one more game, I'm going to sign you up for the military. Right. That's, that's where that's at, God bless. And we're playing baseball and softball. Nobody's in trouble. Right? right. Too many kids are playing this game like it's a three-hour timeout, like they're in trouble. Right. Instead of having fun and learning. and See, a, a, a lot of young coaches, they want to put their stamp on, on a kid that, oh, I helped him play in college. I helped him play in the big leagues. No. If we were smart as, as, as youth coaches, we, we would teach uh, young boys how to become men through baseball, how to fail, how to have success, how to be a good teammate. And then if he <clears> plays <throat> in the big leagues, that's icing on the cake. Right. Right. Yeah. Um, and I – that's, I mean, that's, that's pretty true because a lot of, a lot of parents, I feel like put a lot of pressure on these kids and sometimes they want to li live their, you know, dreams through the kids. So yeah. I think that's why, and I, and honestly, I've experienced it myself. Like I've had a, just in the past couple of years, I've had about five, six kids that quit between the ages of 14, 15, one at 13, one at 12, because, because the, the parents are too intense and I, I don't think they let the kids play with, with freedom. So it's obviously it makes it pretty hard for them to enjoy the game. Hey, um, I, I don't, I don't mean to come off as holier now either. I got kicked out of a twelve-year-old all-star game. <laughs> and the umpire, umpire was so bad, bro. I said, "Could you try not to be a factor in the game, please?" I didn't even <laughs> yell it, and he kicked me out. <laughs> yeah, I've been kicked out one time, and I, and that's it, never again. But hopefully, hopefully. Um, now, <clears throat> um, so when you have kids, uh, because this happens a lot with the younger ones, and I know you talked about getting hit when you were when you were younger. So how do we get rid of that fear? Because, you know, some kids might've got hit when they were in T-ball or coach pitch or wh whatever. And then they're, they're having a hard time at the plate because they feel, even feel the ground balls, they feel like they're going to get hit. How did they build that confidence back? Well, I mean, you're, I always say you're going to know that if your kid's going to be a baseball player the first time he gets hit, you know, because if he's got a little toughness in him, then, then he'll be okay. If he doesn't, he's probably going to go play football. Right. Mm -hmm. We watch football for a reason, bro, because they were afraid of a baseball when they were 10. Thank God, because I love football, NFL. But if you ask any NFL and college guy, how come we don't play baseball? <laughs> because they got hit by a pitch, you know. Yeah. Uh, there's two things why we watch football. They got hit by a pitch when they were 10. They couldn't hit a curveball. Uh, right. But you know what? You got you to gotta train them how to get hit. Uh, when I talked to the parents, I said, you know what? Every time your kid gets hit by a pitch, you know, give him five or ten bucks if he doesn't cry. You know, I mean, sometimes that works, but it's hard, man. I mean, there's fear factor in baseball and nobody talks about it. You right. Know, I, I couldn't recommend, you know, AJ Pollock wears a face mask now. You know why? Because he got, he was down on a rehab <clears throat> game in AAA and he got hit in the face when it was too late. Mm -hmm. You know, where one, you know, I, if, if, with all the body armor that they're wearing, you know, it, I'd get my kid some body armor if he's a little bit afraid. Man, get him an arm guard, get him a, you know, uh, a face mask, and he should be pretty good. Right, right. Now, well, what about and, and another thing? Ahead. Don't don't make him play year round. Give him a break. Right. Go play mm -hmm. basketball. 
you know, go play, you know, I'm not a big football guy, but go play basketball, go play soccer. I rag soccer, but it's like good for the, the, the feet and the hand eye coordinate or the hand foot coordination, just getting some, uh, competing them and dig it in there and getting in the middle of stuff and teaches you how to compete a little bit. Right. Right. Now, when it comes to, cause I, I, I love this, your story about when you were, when you were in high school. So if what, what kind of, um, um, recommendation would you give to a, a, a freshman high school player that's just trying to make the varsity team? Because not everybody's going to make the varsity team depending on the size of the school. So how, how, how can they stay motivated? Well, you have to think big picture. It's like right. I said, you need to put yourself in an oven that you're playing this game another eight years if you're a freshman. You got four in high school, four in college. And now you want to play pro baseball one day. Now you're playing another 15 to 20 years. But we don't think that way. We think it's all about right now. Parents say, oh, it's all about right now. You know, it's like I said, 12-year-olds are 100 pounds away from their man body, and they're playing with tension, anxiety, and pressure to win a freaking trophy. It's, it's, it's a joke. You know, and, and please don't take it the wrong way because I want to win too, but I want to win the right way. I don't want to win at all costs. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. I want to win the right way. I want to teach. I want to develop. Uh, I'm involved with an organization in uh, in Tennessee, Nashville, wild card baseball. And you know what? This is about developing. This is about having them play next year. Uh, you know, I love the line that these kids are 100 pounds away from their man body. Vanderbilt's not panicking if they don't have a bad weekend. They have a bad weekend. This is right. we got to put things in perspective, and sometimes you need to think for the parent. And parents, you are your kid's number one coach. I don't care what you do for a living; you live with them, right? If I need a plumber, I ain't calling uh, Paul Goldsman. I'm calling a plumber. <laughs> well, my kid right. wants to be a baseball player. I need you to get great at listening to my audio. It's the best thing I ever did in my life. Is what I put on <laughs> what I know on an audio twenty years ago. Mm -hmm. I had George Horton, Cal State Fullerton Hall of Fame coach the best and i gave him one as soon as i made it i was an agent i was trying to help my kids get a mental game i didn't even know what i had and i let him listen to it didn't know if he's going to listen to it or not he had his whole team listen to it five hours before they played miami in miami when miami was number one team in the country and they swept them and scored 10 a game he said spring you change the way we think you know right. i mean i'm good when i'm confident how do i create confidence is the question Right. And, and this is why we need to change what we think success is. Uh, Augie Garrido said it's his favorite quote he's ever heard. And this is the Hall of Fame coach, five national championship. If you get your players playing and I don't give a crap mode about me, it's not about me. It's about me helping my team. Those are two completely different players. And you get 25 confident players playing like it's opening day every day. Mm -hmm. Opening day every day. Right? I got a wristband that says compete with confidence and opening day every day that I pass out at my speaking engagement. Because I know they're going to compete. They have right. to. They're in the game. If they're not competing with 100% confidence, right. Then, right? then something's wrong mentally. And it's usually yesterday's bad game mindset play today. And Augie said it's his favorite quote he's ever heard because we all know the feeling of opening day. 100% confident. But then what happens? Day number two shows up. And mm -hmm. now, I'm, now I'm 0 for 4 opening day. Now I'm 0 for 2. Now in my mind I'm 0 for 6. And I'm letting yesterday, yesterday's bad game mindset play today. And that's where the trap of baseball is. It's where the trap of life is, is letting yesterday's bad game mindset play today. Right. I got a yeah. new game, new pitcher, new hero tonight. <laughs> mm -hmm. Right. Yeah, I always thought when I worked with the kids, I mean, um, I don't know if I – I think I got this. Maybe might have been from you. Um, I forget the other guy's name. But I always tell the kids to focus on the next pitch because the, the, what they do, they try to carry on that pitch before and the one before and the one before, and they can't, they can't get out of it. So, like, when I work with them, I always talk about the next pitch, um, the last one it's over with. Um, now, when it comes to at-bats, um, at so when would you start your at-bats? So when do you think the at-bat the at -bat really starts? Well, I used to think when I was in the on-deck circle, you know, and you could really see the pitcher. And I got a, had a guy named Tommy McCraw that changed my life, which made me think about my audio because he was a roving coach with the Mets, and he'd come in for three days a month. And every time he was there, I was a stud. And I'd carry it for three days, but I'm a dummy and, and I'd forget. And, but as dumb as I was, I was smart enough to realize when that guy was around, I was good. So I went to his room. He was nice enough to talk to me about me. Uh, I brought a tape recorder up there and for 20 minutes, it was about what he thought I needed to do to play in the big leagues. And it changed my life. And I remember him asking me vividly, he said, spring, when's hit and start? I said, you know, when I'm in the on deck circle and I could see the pitcher, he said, spring hit and starts when you pick up the paper in the morning. 
nowadays go online and see who's pitching. You start to visualize yourself hitting missiles off this guy because mm-hmm. the mind, the mind doesn't know the body's not doing it. If I took a whole team and I took half the team and I said, go take batting practice for an hour. And I took the other half of the team and I said, go take, uh, go visualize yourself hitting missiles off the starting pitcher for four minutes. And you ask me who I think is going to have a better game. I'm going to take the guys that never took a bad swing because that's how powerful the mind is. So hitting starts when you know who's pitched and you start visualizing yourself hitting missiles off the guy. Right. No, I, I like that. I like that because, um, you know, now that I'm older, I kind of have my own uh, goals. I even write them down and everything. So I kind of want to visualize it before, before well, it you happens. Talk, and- you talk about writing stuff down. In, in pro baseball, you get 500 at-bats every year, five at-bats a day every day whether you want them or not. And mm-hmm. I knew I had to do three or four things to have success. And But I'm not that smart to remember them. So I took a piece of white athletic tape. I wrote them down on my helmet, breathe, attack the inside part of the ball, uh, you know, tall backside, you know, <clears throat> and, and then I put it in my helmet. And 500 bats a year, I ain't going to, oh, oh breathe, oh, have a tall backside, oh, attack right. the inside part of the ball. And it was, it's brilliant. So when the, when, the, when I was at the Blue Jays, trust me, every single player had three or four things in his helmet they got their own helmets nowadays so he's not going two weeks dude mm-hmm. i hit with bo bichette when he was 12 <laughs> his dad bought my stuff and this guy i call everybody up that orders my stuff i thank him and he ends up setting me up a speaking engagement i go out there and bo was 12 and he was a stud then and then the blue jays took him and uh, you know it's just it's like I said, I mean, whether I'm talking to a 10 year old or a major league all-star, my message is the same. And yeah. it, it's about competing with confidence and having fun and, 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 you know, nobody's in trouble. Right. Baseball is not a three hour timeout, <laughs> uh, <laughs> right. but we, 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 somewhere along the line, but we've made it life and death. Mm-hmm. Yeah. No, I, I like that about the whole help me thing to keep reminding you that way you don't have to write it down. You keep seeing it over and over and over. Just the, a well, reminder. We, we, we give ourselves too much credit to remember what we're taught. Mm-hmm. You know, I usually when I speak and I'll, I'll say, I'll say that at the end. I mean, if, if I come back in two weeks, what I say as a group, Oh, something about the bad average American athlete. <clears throat> <laughs> That's what they remember. So their kid might be a big leaguer. Right. <laughs> it's one of right. my jokes. You throw a girl a ball and she fumbles it, bro. Pass. <laughs> right. I don't care how cute she is, man. I'm thinking about your kids. <laughs> Marry <Yeah>. an athlete. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, now, when a kid's at the plate, a hitter's at the plate, like what should be the one thing they should focus on? Like, is there a particular thing they should be focusing on? Or no, there, I think there's a couple of things. I mean, one, this shouldn't be your first at bat unless you're the leadoff guy. I mean, mm-hmm. you should have. If I'm hitting fifth, I should have four at bats off this guy. Uh, I should be hunting speeds, hunt the fastball till it's time not to. If you're trying the old, oh, I'm going to sit fastball and adjust. You know, that was the old thinking. You know, mm-hmm. that, that's my two strike approach. Right. So if you're trying to hit the fastball, curveball, slide up, change up, oh, oh, the no, oh count, you're basically two strike hitting the whole at bat. And it's really, really hard to hit 94 and 79 at the same time. So why would I try it? I, I'm in control of the box until I get two strikes. You know what? Sometimes I'm going to sit off speed. You tell me, if, if you smoke a guy's fastball, your first at bat for a bomb or a double, and now you come up the runners on second and third, your next at bat. Do you think two out of three or three out of four are going to be a fastball or off speed? Mm-mm. So you're going to be off speed. So why am I sitting fastball? You're looking for right. something you're not going to get. Right. right? And, and Clint Hurdle said it as good as you could. I was listening to MLB radio and he said it's really, really hard at 94 and 79 at the same time. And he's so right. You know when I can do it? I can do it off a lefty. Right. I was a right handed hitter. If I thought fastball away and I let the ball get a little bit deeper and then. I see this, you know, with his wrist up in here, I, and I haven't shifted through my middle end swing. I could still put a good swing on it, but right, right on right when it, when it, when he's throwing ninety seven, and it might be out of your head, but it might be a slider in the dirt. A little different story, right? Right. No, I, I like that because I've always said that that it's, you know, <coughs> excuse me. I always hear that, you know, sit fast for and adjust the off speed, but I just don't think it's that that easy. I mean, obviously, I haven't. I'm um, playing a long time, but I just I, I've, I I got that from you actually, and I was like, you know what, that makes a lot of sense because you know a lot of times we just go up there almost like winging it, you know, we're just trying to look for fast one, and then if we get an off speed, let's see what happens. Um, do you do you recommend the younger ones, um, you know, like maybe in high school or a little bit younger, to um, 
up in the count to look for fastball and lay off the off speed or is 100%. It, it's, okay. well, I'm what this is why you watch the game. You watch the pitcher. The pitcher's the test. Right. You know, when I when I go speak, you guys say you want to be big leaguers. The next time you watch a major league baseball game on TV, mm -hmm. stop watch stop watching it like you're a fan. Watch it like you're gonna get in that bat. <laughs> Start thinking with the pitcher. And I guarantee you after the second inning, you're gonna be better. There ain't no there ain't no chemistry test in the third inning. Right, the mm -hmm. pitcher's the test. Keep your eyes on him. Just because he has his breaking ball not working, that means he's a one pitch pitcher. It doesn't mean he's not going to find it in the third, fourth inning. Mm -hmm. and, and this is why you watch the game. You watch the pitch. You see what the guy's throwing. And, right. and the video on a pitcher two weeks ago is great. Watching every pitch he makes tonight, I'm always ten times better. Right, ten mm -hmm. times better. Mm -hmm. But and, and I'm going to hunt the fastball till it's time not to. There's three things that get hairs out more than anything. It's walking up to the plate with no confidence because you're having a pity party over yesterday and last week and your stats. Uh, it's trying to hit the fastball, curveball, slide up, change up. Oh, oh, you're looking for everything. You're not ready for anything. And it's pulling pitches that shouldn't be pulled. Right. right. You, you could look away and hit in. You cannot look in and hit away. Mm -hmm. and, and, and we need to, we need to start teaching hit ability instead of power. Cause right now we're teaching power over hit ability. Right. And this is why we got this zillion strikeouts and, if you would have shifted on me, I would have hit 600, right? We're mm. teaching, we're teaching, we're teaching strikeouts over ground balls, you right. know, I mean, for pitchers. I mean, we got it backwards, you know, mm. because somebody looked at a stat sheet and said, oh, this is what we need. Well, really, I, I got, I got a runner on third with the infield back with in a tie game and I can't hit a ground ball to second or short to win the game. It's mind blowing to me. Right. I'm going to try and hit a home run and I do it one every 30 at bats. Right. Play. Play to win the game is what we need to teach again. Mm -hmm. I mean, we, we have all these analytics. We have these we have these defensive analytics, and, and we're going to shift, and we're going to put everything right there. Well, if they have that defensive analytics, shouldn't there be an offensive analytic that if I hit a ground ball to second base, we score? <laughs> the counter, right. the defensive. It's all defensive analytics. There's no offensive analytics. Right. And let, let, me, let me ask you this, because obviously <laughs> I've never played at that level, but – now that with the shift, um, you know, and, and I know the shift has been there for a long, long time, but um, is it really hard to hit the ball the opposite way? So if you got a guy that pulls the crap out of the ball and you got everybody playing on the left side or everybody playing on the right side, depending on who, who's up, like, is it that hard to hit the ball the other way? Even if it's like ground no, ball to get it No, through? no, I didn't think so. Because you, if you remember, every time you took batting practice, you had an oppo round. Oh, what, that, right. what, what do you do? You let the bug a little bit deeper. And this is how I, I invented attack the inside part of the baseball, mm -hmm. right? Because I, it's impossible as a right-handed hitter to hit a line drive to right field on the outside part of the baseball. You're on the inside part of the baseball, but the contact point's a little bit deeper. It's about right on front of the plate, right? Mm -hmm. If the ball's right down the middle, it just goes up about six inches. If the ball's middle in, I'm still attacking the inside part of the baseball, but it's it's out in front of the plate, right? Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, and, and you'll miss balls that go out attacking mm -hmm. the inside part of the baseball. We get so caught up in launch angle. You want, you want some launch <clears> angle, attack the inside part of the baseball, you'll create some bat spin. Right. And th this is what happens is we try and pull a pitch that shouldn't be pulled. And I can't tell you how many 2-0 fastballs I beat in the ground to shortstop trying to pull a, pull a fastball that shouldn't be pulled. It should have been driven to right center. Mm -hmm. But the, the thing it has, it has something to do with, you know, they're getting paid to basically to hit it out of the park. Is that, is that, is yeah, that, is that, is that, yeah, yeah. And there's no doubt about it, you know. Right. I mean, but I, I think it's a, it's a, it's mind blowing. You look back at the old thing. I, I, th I think it was Ted Kluzinski or something like that, some old time guy who had 40 home runs and he struck out less than 40 times. <laughs> wow. That you know, I, I just believe that the better hitter you become, the more your power is going to play down the road. Like not every, not every <laughs> uh, stadium in the big leagues is Petco, San Diego. There's some band boxes in there. Right. Colorado, Houston. I mean, you know, the ball flies in Toronto. So the better hitter you become, the more your power is going to play. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, well, Steve, I'm not trying to keep you on too long. I'm almost, I'm almost done here. Um, You're I really good, bud. Appreciate it for all your information so far. Um, but what, what kind of recommendation, recommendation would you give to the parents that you know have kids or play, but sometimes I feel like they get a little bit intense or they get out of line with their kids. How can they help them out? 
Well, I think parents need to learn how to breathe also. You know, I, I when I talk about breathing with my my players, I say you're going to be your best athlete when your heart beats between 60 and 80 at all times. Uh, the only time I want your heartbeat over 80 on a baseball field is when you hit a triple. Uh, and it's the same thing with parents. When you start getting all, you know, high heartbeat and, and, and start panicking, you know, you need to realize that Vanderbilt's not panicking when your 12-year-old has a bad weekend. And we need to think big picture. Right. You know, I highly recommend getting my bundle, which is everything that I made uh, for the price of a half a hitting lesson. If you didn't know the right coupon code and I'll give it to you, it's MLB40. You get everything I made for $40 and uh, including my book springtime soon to be a movie, buddy. I got a movie okay. coming out. I got the producers of wedding crashers writing it right now. And we're just doing it to try and inspire kids. We're going baseball version of Rudy. Uh, I didn't start in high school. I got cut in college. I played in the big leagues and now all stars call me. Uh, in my mind, that's a tick bear and Rudy. <laughs> so, and, and they believe so too. So I signed a contract with Panay films and, uh, you know, have me come speak to your program. I, I speak all over the country. I was in uh, at the ABCA with 6,000 coaches and it was awesome. You know, I spoke there three times and, you know, I was there trying to set up speaking engagements. It's the most reasonable thing ever. I charge $75 a kid, mm -hmm. usually to get on a plane, 80 kid minimum and, you know, gets me six grand. I give you guys all the money, make it a fundraiser. You can right. take all the money after that. Make every kid bring somebody. Now we got a fundraiser. I hit with your kid that set it up, and uh, it's money back guarantee. If a parent says that was just okay, I'll give them their money back. Uh, right. You know, I give them a wristband, compete with confidence, open day every day, and they get everything that I made. But you know, as parents, we love our kids so much, we die for him. Yet we sabotage their sports career by putting so much pressure on them. And I'm not saying everybody gets a trophy, Mark, uh, and right. I'm not in on that. But I, I just believe at that, that 12U that you're coaching and, and a lot of a lot of kids are, you guys are their kids coach and, and you're the one that are introducing them to the tension, anxiety and pressure instead mm -hmm. of calmness, toughness and focus, having fun. And the number one thing out of those three things that you better have, calmness, toughness and focus, you better be tough. Mm -hmm. Right. And because you're playing a game, you do everything right, go 0 for 4. You do nothing right, go 0 for 4. And now I'm supposed to compete with confidence. How do you do it? Right what we just talked about for the last 45 minutes. That's how you do it. Mm -hmm. No, that, that's pretty awesome. Well, Steve, let me wrap it up with these four fun questions here. And then I promise uh, I'll let you go. And I'll definitely put all the links below for uh, uh, quality at bat so you can get the bundle. And I'm definitely pretty excited to, to know when the movie will come out. I think that will be a pretty, pretty amazing story. So, and help out a lot of kids. Um, so the first one will be, so what's, what, what out of all the years that you've played, what's one coach that you think helped you out the most and why? And, and, and again, you don't have to say names, but if you do great, but I just want to know why, like why you think is. Well, the, I got two names that come up to my, to my mind. One is Tommy McCraw and mm -hmm. putting that, putting that thing on audio for me. Cause I, I truly believe that we give ourselves too much credit to remember what we're taught. And when mm -hmm. I had that audio, if I was in my car for for seven years, it was on. And same thing when I made all my audios. And, you know, A.J. Pollock told me, listen to it a thousand times. Daniel Murphy, a thousand times. You know, so and and, and, and Clint Hurdle, uh, who I basically stole quality at bats from. And he was the manager of my team. He's my root. He was my teammate in 86, and he was my manager in 1992-93. And uh, he would put a cue on the lineup card if you had a quality at bat. And I'm like, what's that cue? And he's like, it means you had a quality at bat, dummy. And so I knew that if I had two or three on there, whether I got a hit or not, I'm playing the next game. And right. and that was a big part of my life. So probably those two coaches. That's cool. What about your favorite player that you've that you've um, uh, worked with? You know what? Uh, anyway, that I work with are my favorite players. Like I've worked with Nolan Arenado. I played with his uh, uh, high, uh, junior football when I was eight with his dad. So I've known Nolan his whole life. He's awesome. I know, uh, you know, with AJ and, 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 uh, and uh, Goldsmith have called me their whole career. You know, Mark Trumbo was a big part of my life, teaching him, uh, you know, what I teach. And it, it, it's just, you know, anybody that, uh, that I've helped, there's so many guys that I've helped that I don't even know about, you know, it's just like, really? Yeah. It, like Ben Zobrist. I was at a Christian retreat with my wife and didn't know anybody there all major league minor league baseball players i'm in a seven-man group at 10 o'clock at night and i said 
you know, my name's Steve Springer. I'm the mental coach of the Blue Jays. I see this 20 year old kid smiling. I'm like, you got my stuff, don't you, buddy? He's like, I can't believe you're here. He said, I can't wait till I tell you my brother-in-law you're here. He's going to flip. I said, who's your brother-in-law? He said, Ben Zobris. I said, he's got it. And he's like, oh, dude, wait till he finds out you're here. And I'm like, yeah, he owes me 20 bucks too. <laughs> I'm kidding. Well, I meet him that night. And he gives me the biggest hug I've ever had. And he said, dude, you changed my life. He was 25 years old in double A beating himself up, non-confident Ben Zobers playing. And when he heard the band average thing, he said it hit him right between the teeth. Two years later, he was a major league all-star because he said, I don't care anymore. All right? If you like your abilities and your abilities aren't showing up, it's not your abilities problem. It's what you're thinking. Mm -hmm. And non-confident Ben stopped playing and his abilities came out, MVP of the Cubs World Series. I believe the Cubs owe me a, a, a ring. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, <laughs> that's pretty amazing. Um, what about your least favorite player? Again, you don't have to say names, but what would be your least favorite player to work with? Well, I really don't have any that I work with, but my least favorite player that I like watching is a, a powder. Mm -hmm. uh, don't pout, bro. I don't care if you get mad. Just don't be an idiot. But if you pout, I'm not saying you're soft, buddy, but it sure does look soft. Right. Right. What, what about... Um, if we were to picture the perfect team, what would it be? Perfect, perfect team. Ba perfect baseball team, yes. Well, what would, would it look like? It would look like 25 confident players playing to win the game and and not dig, not the dig me guy that, you know, every time you do something right, you got to pound the chest, kiss the sky. And, you know, I, I'm not on that. I play to help your team win the game. Get 25 confident players showing up to win the game. Augie Garrido had me come in there uh for three days the, and I, I spoke to his team in 2012 i didn't know how they were doing i'm like i knew tommy nicholson i never met augie i said hey you want me to speak to your team because he he's had me speak at sac state when he was there and and um he said dude if we go six and oh we don't win our conference championship uh augie's not going to pay you and i said i'll do it for free i want to meet augie augie's like what do you say bring him in so i go in and I drive to Baylor hour and a half. They're in a hotel. I couldn't have spoke better. Same stuff we're talking about right now. I'm Millie Vanilli, a one hit wonder. And I couldn't have spoke better. And, and I'm about ready to leave. And my buddy's like, Augie wants to see you. So I go in there and he's like, okay, buddy, we're going to pay you for that. And I want in here, you in here next year for three days. <laughs> he says, he gave me the best compliment I've ever had in my life. And, and I, um, I go back in there in September, the same exact team with freshmen, Moy, not another person on it was one game away from the national championship because they got 25 confident players showing up. Same team, same bodies with a different mindset. And, right. and they were one game away from the national championship. The right. same team that just came in ninth place in their division. That's crazy. That's yeah. pretty awesome. That's pretty awesome. That's pretty, that's pretty powerful stuff too. Well, Steve, I really hope I can get you here to uh, to Oklahoma uh, in the summertime. I'd love to have you to have you here. Um, I know you'll also be in the in the area in uh, in the yeah. summer, so I'd I'm, love to I'm see scouting, something. I'm scouting with the Oklahoma A's now, and I, I have Oklahoma City as my coverage, so I will be there. So we are going to set something up. Okay. Okay. Awesome. Um, yeah, and I'm gonna again. I'm gonna leave all all the links uh, below for uh, quality at bats. I, I highly recommend following his stuff because. To be honest, like I said at the beginning, I wish I had it when I when I was playing. It would have made a big difference in my career. So, um, and if you guys are watching this on YouTube, please subscribe, give it a thumbs up, and remember, keep it moist out. Hey guys, moist out baseball here. If you're interested in having me come out to your city for a fielding camp or a hitting camp, or if you're in the Oklahoma area and you're looking for private lessons or group lessons, you can shoot me a text at two five one five zero nine three eight. One five. You can also email me at moistout33 at gmail.com. Keep it moist out.